Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to CGHE webinar on AI in higher education. So this is an exciting and timely webinar series that we have ahead of us, um, which will cover six webinars with excellent speakers on various aspects of, of artificial intelligence in the sector. My name is Janja Komjenovic, and today we will be hearing from Ben Williamson on the social lives of AI in higher education. Ben is a senior lecturer at the Center for Research in Digital Education at the University of Edinburgh in UK and an editor of Learning Media and Technology. But before I hand over to Ben, there are some brief housekeeping points to mention. Um, okay, so this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the Center website, I think tomorrow morning or very soon after that. Uh, the transcript of the chat function conversation will also be posted. Um, and at some point, it's likely we will also share the audio recording on the center um, podcast. Um, please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak uh, or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so when you will be asking the question. Uh, we recommend that you use the speaker view so you can more clearly see who is talking. And to ask a question, please use the chat function and write out the question you wish to ask after the end of the presentation. So when Ben finishes, if your question is selected, so I'll be keeping an eye, I will select uh, the question and then you will be invited to ask it yourself directly. Uh, so you will get the floor to switch your microphone on when and if invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you're from. Okay, now I will pass over to Ben Williamson for the first webinar in our series on AI in higher education. Welcome, Ben. Thank you very much, Yanya. Let's get set up here a moment. Okay, thanks very much for having me to this series. Um, I'm very much looking forward to trying to engage with uh, as many of the other talks as I can as well. And possibly I'm in a similar position to many of the rest of you of feeling uh, somewhat overwhelmed by the kind of deluge of AI in education and higher education specifically, uh, news and developments so over the past year or so. Um, so obviously I think for, I imagine for most of you coming, um, you're aware that AI has been the subject of uh, significant hype, uh, as well as uh, significant anxiety over the last uh, at least 12 months. Sometimes indeed kind of anxiety that, that functions as, as hype as well. Now my position is that there have undoubtedly been some um, incredibly impressive uh, tech breakthroughs that have become apparent to us um, more publicly uh, in the past year. Um, but at the same time, applications like uh, ChatGPT and Midjourney and Bard, uh, and Claude and uh, Llama and so on um, are also, of course, highly controversial and contested and the subject of some resistance um, by, uh, by some individuals and organizations. So rather than treating um, AI simply as a kind of set of technologies, what I want to do in this talk is to explore what I've been calling um, the social lives of AI. And um, by this, what I mean is um, an attention to the social contexts in which AI is made, um, the social actors that interpret, promote, or resist it, uh, and the actual social settings where it's used uh, or applied. So AI is not alive, of course, as much as um, some people seem to uh, dream of kind of artificial general uh, intelligence uh, with, with consciousness and sentience and so on. Um, the metaphor of, uh, of the social lives of AI is, is rather an effort to kind of attune our attention to the past developments the present appearance and the possible futures that AI is uh, said by some 
uh, to be uh, putting in motion. And I hope the talk really serves as a kind of um, setting of the scene for the rest of the series and, and other speakers, I think, will we'll go into much more depth on some of the things that I'm going to sort of touch on. Ben, ben, sorry, before you continue, some people say they have trouble hearing you. Is there any way that you can turn on the volume of your microphone? Um, okay, I can look and see if I can do that. Let's do, let's escape out of here a minute. Um, Sorry about that. It's okay. If it doesn't work, someone said that the caption function works, so that might be helpful as well for the for the well, participants. Normally, there's no problem with the microphone on here. I don't know if you can hear me now, but I'm. Um... I'm not sure there's much I can do. Um, should I just try and continue, Yanya? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Okay, I'm really sorry, everybody, if you're unable to hear clearly. Just restart this. Okay, hopefully everybody will be able to hear me. I'll try and speak as clearly as possible. Um, so, um, as I'm sure most people are aware, a, a lot has happened uh, in the last 12 months. So it was only last October um, that uh, there were initial reports appearing of students apparently cheating um, with AI. And... Uh, Cat GPT bans in schools and universities, um, of course, followed swiftly at the beginning of, of 2023. But at um, exactly the same time, um, a range of others uh, began um, excitedly talking about AI's huge potential uh, to transform uh, higher education and indeed school education uh, too. So the kinds of arguments that, that were emerging were about the potential uses of ChatGPT and others to uh, augment or to support students studying and research practices, um, to speed up the preparation of pedagogic materials uh, for teachers, to help students write assignments, um, and even uh, extending to the idea of adding automated uh, tutor bots um, to classes as kind of uh, algorithm-driven uh, teaching uh, assistance. And we've seen very recently, for example, uh, Khan Academy um, launch uh, the Khan Migo tutor bot, uh, which is currently trialing in schools uh, in the States, specifically as a kind of teaching assistant or a augmented uh, teacher in, in the classroom. And only uh, last week, OpenAI, of course, the company behind ChatGPT launched um, a guide for teaching with ChatGPT, um, which I think captures and amplifies the set of kind of transformative expectations that are surrounding AI in, in education uh, at the moment. But most of the content in that particular OpenAI uh, document is produced by a business school professor based in the States. Um, who seems to recently have become one of the most kind of entrepreneurial and influential voices on AI in, uh, in, in education. So in just a year, it seems almost as if AI has become uh, an inevitable feature of, of education um, to which students and uh, teachers or educators, it appears, are almost expected to adapt. But what I and a, a number of colleagues who've um, done various pieces of work on uh, AI in education in recent years. What, what, what we've tried to suggest is that AI has a much longer history um, than recent events would suggest, maybe histories perhaps, and it's also tangled up with a, with a wide range of quite complex um, issues. So in the rest of this talk, the next 20 minutes or so, 
Um, what I want to do is draw from a series of collaborative writing projects. Um, so, for example, a special issue that I edited with Rebecca Ainan a few years ago on uh, uh, AI and education sort of histories and futures. Um, a chapter, again, with Rebecca, but also Jeremy Knox and Hugh Davis. Um, uh, sort of uh, summarizing a series of critical perspectives on AI in education and uh, a recent commentary I wrote for the International Journal of AI in Education um, with a very similar title to today's talk um, which I was asked to write as part of an interdisciplinary dialogue um, assessing AI in education from so some contributions are from the perspective of AI ed developers and then some um, some more sort of social scientific commentary on that type of work. And uh, there's a recent book that Yanya and Cal Golson and I have edited and is out shortly on um, education in the era of algorithms, automation and artificial intelligence. So I'm drawing on this, this set of materials. And just to be clear, the, the talk is focused on the, the, sort of the teaching and learning aspects of higher education. I'm not touching on AI in, in research at all today. But besides having a kind of uh, a complex past and, and present, um, various forms of um, various different instantiations of AI, AI also has what we might say is a kind of contested future. Um, so I'm also working at the moment in relatively early stages on some work for the Centre for Socio-Digital Futures with colleagues in Bristol and uh, Oxford, um, where we're looking at artificial intelligence and automation as a particular kind of future that's, that's in the making. And we're examining the various claims that surround artificial intelligence and automation in education. And then in later parts of the project, um, aiming to look at the ways in which those claims encounter uh, specific social contexts and everyday practices um, and, and how things therefore play out. Okay, so just in terms of my focus on kind of AI's social lives, just briefly, I sort of separate out the idea of AI's social lives into production and productivity. Um, so the first thing we might say is that AI does have a very long and varied history of development and evolution across varied sites of research and development, uh, mostly in universities and commercial settings. So we could say that historically speaking, AI has moved through sort of three main uh, periods of development. We have a kind of uh, the idea of um, AI as expert systems or rule-based and pre-programmed knowledge models that emerged in the 1960s and was represented in the educational space through ideas about intelligent tutoring systems or uh, computer-supported collaborative learning. More recently, the kind of second wave of AI, if you like, um, was um, uh, came about through the development of big data storage uh, and the application of uh, machine learning and predictive analytics to, to very, very large stores of, of data. And in the educational space, we saw that playing out uh, in terms of learning analytics and ideas about adaptive learning software. And we're now in what we might see then as a kind of a third wave um, that in includes the, the first two in, in, in many ways, but advances on them. And this is the kind of wave of generative AI, of large language models, of image generators underpinned by natural language processing and so-called uh, transformer models. And in the educational context, we see things like the idea of automated text, you know, assignment generation, uh, chatbots and, and tutor bots uh, appearing at the moment. So a way of, sort of seeing AI in terms of its production is to see it as a set of quite different kinds of apparatuses that are produced from accumulating technologies, settings, and practices. So AI is not simply uh, technology that appears from, from, from nowhere. Uh, it's the product of human actors, of organizational objectives, of funding arrangements, and of various forms of knowledge, uh, assumptions, values, and indeed visions of future application and use. And importantly, as people like Meredith Broussard have pointed out, these uh, technologies do not always work as planned uh, or expected. 
And the second way of um, talking about AI's social lives in the way I approach it, at least, is in terms of productivity. Um, so once an AI is produced, as a kind of a, through the apparatus I've just briefly outlined, then it becomes potentially productive of new ways of acting, thinking, uh, and making uh, decisions. And it circulates in and interacts with different contexts and settings, and AI is variously interpreted, accommodated, or in some cases, uh, rejected. So as Rebecca Ainan and Erin Young put it in a, an article two years ago, um, he said, AI is a complex social, cultural, and material artifact that's understood and constructed by different stakeholders uh, in different ways. And these differences have significant social and educational implications. So they pointed out particularly how AI is understood and approached uh, quite differently in academic R&D as a kind of methodology, um, through the ways it's approached by industry, as a source of value creation, and again, to the way that um, policy groups um, mobilize AI as part of uh, reformatory uh, visions. And we might add to that, that AI has also um, become a, a kind of domain of, of, or a contested domain of ethical uh, and regulatory attention too. So I'm gonna work through some aspects of this social life relatively briefly, starting with, the social life of AI research and development. Um, so I think it's really important to situate what we're experiencing now as part of a much longer series of developments within the academy, um, and particularly within what is sometimes described or identified as uh, AI ed, or AI and education, as a kind of field um, uh, in itself. And this is a uh, a kind of a gathering of computer science, of learning sciences and industry, which has been supported by uh, international societies and publishers and funding schemes um, over several decades uh, and incorporates um, other practices like educational data sciences, educational data mining uh, and learning analytics. So an awful lot of the recent work over the last 20 years and learning analytics is now very much kind of um, aligning itself with with AI uh, in education. And you can see a quote from a relatively early paper in the uh, International Journal of Artificial Intelligence from Shank and Edelson uh, rationalizing the role of AI in education. AI concerns itself with getting machines to read, to reason, to express themselves, to make generalizations and learn. These are the stuff of education after all. And they suggested then that AI people are in a unique position to improve education. So the idea that we can insert AI into education has a very long history that emerged from particular kinds of power struggles um, by AI um, experts to insert themselves into educational debates and design um, uh, innovations and intervene uh, in education too. So AI in education is a kind of interdisciplinary, cross-sector apparatus of research and development practices. And as Carlo Perotta and Neil Selwyn have fairly recently argued, it often layers algorithmic complexity on uh, sometimes quite reductive accounts of learning. You can see on the right-hand side just some of the, the aims and scope of um, one of the most recent journals in, in this particular uh, space. And what we might also say is that AI ed mirrors and adjusts to industry developments uh, and various different techniques. So it is incorporated expert systems from early AI research, then incorporated data mining, predictive data analytics. It uh, sort of emulates the ideals of personalization, most recently turned to ideas of deep learning and indeed generative uh, AI. So that as one of the leading um, scientists of AI in education has recently said, AI has now burst out of university and corporate labs, but even dedicated researchers have been taken aback by the apparent sophistication of large language models like chat GPT. So we're at a particular moment where artificial intelligence in education researchers themselves uh, are seeking to um, 
uh, reflect on and adjust their particular approaches in light of recent industry developments. So talking of those industry developments, um, again, it's important, I think, to point out that um, current concerns that industry, commercial technology companies might be playing a, an outsized role in promoting the idea of AI in education itself has a, a, a kind of longer history. So an early publication by the RAND Corporation assessing the prospects for AI in education, 1993, said that transforming education with AI was going to need um, high tech companies to be brought into better cooperation with educational technology research and classroom practice. And they saw this as a way in which AI could, um, uh, as they put it, threaten existing practices in schools uh, and universities. So there's a long history of industry interacting with, um, uh, with academic artificial intelligence research and seeking to uh, intervene in, in uh, classroom practice. But the current approach to um, AI in education perhaps is proceeding through a couple of other approaches, uh, not just interaction with academic R&D initiatives, but also through um, involvement with education technology platforms and also AI as a service uh, infrastructure. Um, and there's a, a really interesting recent article by Meredith Whitaker writing in the States about the way in which AI industry has really captured um, AI research uh, in general. Uh, and I think it's worth considering ways in which AI industry, which has long played a, a, a fairly significant part in AI in education, might now be playing an increasing role in, in shaping the kind of AI applications that are rolled out into our institutions. So one way in which this is happening is through um, what is often called sort of the platformization of higher education. Uh, so digital platforms that act as kind of mediators, um, uh, sort of digital mediators where learning um, can, can take place. Uh, increasingly uh, are said to be enabling digital transformation in higher education institutions. So there are platforms for online degrees, there are platforms for learning management systems, there are platforms for student information uh, and platforms for myriad other functions of the university too. And then there are platforms that might challenge um, rather than enable the higher education sector. So platforms for alternative providers to offer different kinds of credentials, credentials, for example, or even direct to consumer ed tech platforms that cut out formal higher education altogether and offer uh, different forms of um, uh, provision. Now, the point here is that platforms are the basis on which the data can be collected for things like um, massive data collection, uh, predictive analytics, and the development of automated features. So this might involve, for example, developing and training AI upgrades, personalized features, things like course matching. And I've included the example here of Coursera, a recent uh, report by them that details the ways in which it's amassed hundreds of millions of data points specifically so that it can use those data to develop more AI-like uh, upgrades and, and features for, for the existing platform. And in many ways, of course, uh, Coursera does begin to, to look a little bit like a kind of an alternative platform, using, of course, the, the labor of academics in particular institutions, um, but offering different kinds of uh, qualifications a, along the way. And as uh, Janja Komjenovic and colleagues have recently pointed out, this platformization, which depends on sort of massive datafication, uh, doesn't proceed simply because um, platform companies think it's a great idea to democratize education. It proceeds because it's underpinned by a business model uh, which extracts value uh, 
um, from higher education institutions and users, whilst at the same time seeking to disrupt the sector's core operation. The second aspect of this, and I think quite tightly connected to platformization, is uh, what we might term AI as a service integrations. So an awful lot of education platforms and services that are already used in higher education or are being promoted for use in education are underpinned by very large um, multinational technology companies, big tech, as they're often called, which offer cloud and AI infrastructure as part of um, the, the services that, that they provide. So Amazon Web Services, for example, uh, underpins uh, Blackboard or Canvas, or those kind of learning management systems, and provides the kind of uh, the cloud storage, the data analytics, and the AI infrastructure that's necessary for Blackboard and Canvas uh, to operate in, in the ways that, that they, they're currently developing. And perhaps the, um, uh, the most pressing example um, for us to consider right at the moment, given the uh, huge enthusiasm or concern about generative AI is the role of open AI, um, which is increasingly providing uh, chat GPT or GPT-4 uh, for integration into ed tech platforms. So again, I've just continued with the example of Coursera here, um, which uh, it was announced just yesterday, according to this particular piece, is embracing the potential of generative AI. Um, so it's now developed a generative AI personal, personal learning coach um, uh, and also adding chat GPT powered interactive ed tech tools to its learning platforms, including the coach for students, as well as AI course building tools uh, for teachers. So an organization like OpenAI, which I suspect many of us had only dimly heard about a year ago before ChatGPT launched, is now becoming the kind of infrastructural provider of the kinds of generative AI um, uh, functionality and features that uh, ed tech platforms are now integrating into their existing tools uh, and using to develop new type of functions like these kind of coaches, assistants, uh, and chatbots. And this kind of uh, integration of artificial intelligence into higher education platforms is, of course, itself uh, big business. Um, so investors are getting very uh, enthusiastic about the possibilities of artificial intelligence um, as a driver of growth in higher education as well as in uh, other uh, industries. So ASU GSB Summit, which is the largest ed tech investment um, event uh, in the world, ran a whole series of various different events around AI, um, the prospects for investment, the prospects for return on investment, um, and the kind of transformative um, implications of new AI approaches of the kind inspired by or even integrating um, ChatGPT and others uh, like it uh, in future years. Okay, um, I've just got a couple of other aspects of the social lives of AI to get through before we turn to some questions. There's also the question of the social life of AI in relation to policy. Um, so AI is not just uh, a matter of academic R&D or of industry interest. Uh, it can also be mobilized to support a range of policy aspirations and proposals. And many of the bullet points here will be, I suspect, familiar to many of us who work in higher education. Things like performance measurement, accountability, measurable outcomes and results, uh, ideas about optimizing efficiency, streamlining workload, and so on. Uh, these are all things that uh, AI might intervene in, in various uh, different ways. So I'd recommend the, the book Algorithms of Education by Hal Golson, Sam Seller, and um, P. Taylor Webb as a kind of guide to the way in which AI and other 
algorithmic technologies are um, becoming involved in in um, in education policy uh, more, more more broadly. But I want to just give a couple of brief examples. This is a, some examples from the OECD um, with a, a a fairly large program at the moment about AI the future of education, skills, and work, uh, which I think is very relevant to higher education, or it's certainly intended to be policy relevant in relation to um, higher education and school uh, education. What the OECD is interestingly doing at the moment is testing applications like ChatGPT on its assessments for children and adults. So the PISA test for school children and the PIAC test adults and it's assessing how well chat gpt um, performs on those tests it's using the results of that to suggest that as the title of one of these uh, reports says education might be losing the race with technology what the claim seems to be is that education is teaching outdated knowledge content and skills that um, artificial intelligence is going to automate and therefore, we need to provide opportunities for children and adults alike uh, to uh, renew their skills or indeed develop uh, different kinds of skills. And at the same time, uh, what the OECD is suggesting that AI is a policy relevant solution for optimizing that outdated education. So they write significantly in one of these reports about uh, pushing the frontiers with smart technologies like AI, learning analytics and robotics um, in order to digitalize education, transform education and, and, um, uh, and so on and so forth. And my last example in this particular sort of the, the, the policy social lives is uh, of AI is, is one drawn from the school sector, but I think a potentially useful and interesting one to alert us to the ways in which AI might be used to help support particular political preoccupations, including those um, from the conservative right, um, as in this case, uh, just from a couple of weeks ago in the US, where um, uh, the Iowa uh, Republican um, government has demanded that schools remove books from school libraries that feature specific sexual content and the response of one particular district was to use chat gpt uh, they asked chat gpt which um, of the books in their library featured particular sexual content and then used the basis of the results to to remove those books and uh, perhaps you know uh unsurprisingly uh one of the top books removed from the list was the handmaid's tale um now the teachers or the district authorities there are simply complying with the law um they don't want to be held personally criminal criminally responsible for not implementing uh the, this particular law but i think it does indicate how ai could be used to advance particular um, political agendas and for colleagues working in higher education uh, in the states, given the um, kinds of uh, politics uh, um, being experienced there at the moment, I think this might be might act as a kind of a cautionary tale. Okay, so the final aspect of this, and I want to wrap up in just a few minutes, is around the social life of, of AI uh, ethics. So that has obviously been considerable controversy over the ethical implications of AI in education. There is a really detailed and good report from the Council of Europe out last year. It does mostly focus on the schools sector, but does I think provide the most sort of comprehensive account of, of some of the, the sort of the key issues uh, in this space that I think probably is relevant to the higher education sector as well. It details particular ethical concerns around privacy, data protection, uh, surveillance, erosion of rights, uh, the kinds of threats to educators and students' autonomy that might emerge from the use of, uh, of AI, uh, the factual inaccuracy 
um, that comes from language models. These are, after all, just predicting the next words in, in a sequence and are prone to the pr production of false information um, and so on uh, and so forth. But this report, like others, uh, importantly points out that these kinds of issues are going to remain very hard to resolve due to a lack of international instruments or indeed means of enforcement. Now, there are, of course, organizations, UNESCO, I think, chief among them, who are trying to come up with kind of you know, international instruments to, to, to do this. But it's going to be a long uh, and complex process, um, and it's made more difficult um, by the fact that there are certain AI advocates um, who are deeply antagonistic to AI ethics uh, and diminish it as kind of moralizing or thinly disguised activism. And another challenge here might, of course, be uh, the kind of pro-innovation stance that is taken by uh, some government agencies towards AI as well, but not wanting to stymie the potential for innovation uh, by regulating uh, too, too hard in relation to these ethical issues. I think the absence of those kind of international instruments, this is why I've kind of social, taken a social life of AI approach to ethics is, is kind of interesting, is what we're beginning to see is a proliferation of quite localized attempts to um, mitigate and control for AI given deep concerns over its potential uh, impacts, whether intended or not. And one of the most recent of these kind of local initiatives I've seen is from um, the English literature professor, Catherine Conrad, based in the States, who's recently produced a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights uh, for education. And her argument is not necessarily that um, we need to banish large language models or generative AI from uh, higher education institutions, but rather, she says, to encourage the development and potential adoption of systems that are designed in collaboration with educators, students, and community stakeholders, and developed with careful attention to access, equity, and learning goals. And Conrad proposes um, a, I think a useful series of um, potential rights um, or certainly things for educators to, to consider or educators and their institutions to consider quite seriously. She argues that uh, if AI is to be used in higher education, there then there should be rights for educators. And those might include the right to have input on purchasing, implementation, and institutional policies about the use of AI. Uh, support for professional development. So if an institution is going to purchase and demand implementation of AI, then staff should have support for, for professional development to be able to use it in an informed way. And they should also have autonomy to decide to use it or not. Um, and should also ex uh, have protection of legal rights um, in relation to that. She proposes some similar rights for students uh, so students, where an institution um, is uh, employing the use of AI, should receive clear guidance on the use of generative systems. They should be able to ask questions about the use of AI in their courses. Um, they should have some degree of privacy and creative control, and they should have the right to appeal an automated uh, decision and informed notice when an automated system uh, is deployed. So I think this it usefully illustrates that a range of uh, local initiatives to um, uh, are emerging in the absence of regulation or in the absence of widely agreed kind of ethical frameworks uh, for the deployment of artificial intelligence and in education. That'll be really interesting, I think, and important to document over coming years how some of these um, particular uh, ethical proposals uh, play out. I will leave that slide simply because I want to stop now. I think the, the big question we have remaining open to us is about the social life of AI in higher education practice. Despite the kind of dropping 
of AI in various forms into education over the, the last year and, and longer, I, I still think we really lack uh, any clear sense um, of how it's actually being used in practice beyond I mean, lots of kind of anecdotal sharing of, of good practice and so on, lots and lots of interesting and creative ideas, but also lots and lots of uh, concern over the potentially kind of deleterious effects of, of, of AI in, in education too. I think one of the problems we have here is that um, many claims about AI's beneficial effects in higher education are often speculative. There remains thin evidence of uh, the benefits of AI. Uh, and in some respects, uh, we might understand these claims as kind of power struggles for authority and the capacity to shape uh, the, the, the future of um, higher education uh, itself. Um, I do think it's important to situate these current claims about the transformational impact of AI in contexts of production and, and circulation of the kinds I've tried to at least briefly outline today. Uh, academic, industrial, financial and political contexts are giving rise to the forms of AI that we're experiencing or that, that we're being pressed to adapt to in higher education. And we need much better critical assessment of the possible or likely impacts of, of staff uh, on staff, students and systems. Uh, and we may need to consider whether forms of intervention are necessary to resist or reshape AI in higher education too, of the kind of the AI Bill of Rights for higher education that I outlined a moment ago. Okay, I'm out of time. I will stop right there. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Ben, for this excellent uh, talk. And it's such a great way to introduce the scene for our whole um, series on AI in higher education. I really appreciate it. So we have quite a lively debate in the chat area, and we already have um, a list of people who want to ask questions. Um, so we start with, I have five people on the list, and then let's see how we get on, if we have time for more. Uh, but first question, I, I invite Mark Carrigan. Uh, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you, yeah. And, and thanks, Ben. That was hugely informative, if slightly depressing. Uh, and at risk of sounding like a vulgar Marxist, my question was going to be, what is to be done? And when you talked about Catherine Conrad's work, that did speak to that question to a certain extent. But I do wonder if there's a tendency in how you've set this up to see it as a matter of non-academic, non-educational forces intruding from outside the university. And is there a risk that renders some of the agency we do have opaque? And I entirely uh, agree with the recommendations you're making towards the end. But I'm wondering about how we connect our critical analysis to a kind of prospective practical agenda to intervene and respond to these issues. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, and I know you've been, you know, writing some interesting reflections on experimenting with 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 AI as well and sort of generative AI. Um, I I don't think this is necessarily a kind of non-academic intrusion into higher education. And I think that some of the early parts of the talk around the ways in which you know this this stage was set for AI in higher education by uh, developments in uh, particular aspects of ed educational research is, um, is an important way to approach this, you know, as something that's uh, developed over decades through an array of kind of uh, relationships that have developed between uh, the academy and uh, an industry. At the same time, I do think it's important as, as people like Meredith Whitaker have to remain alert to, um, uh, attempts to have a more of an outsized influence in the ways that we think about the possibilities of um, digital, the use of digital technologies in higher education. It's made to seem inevitable um, when you read um, documents by AWS or Microsoft or Google or, or now OpenAI uh, as well. And I do think that needs our, our critical attention. I think engaging with um, 
So one of the pieces I shared that was published in the International Journal of AI and Education was explicitly, it was part of a special issue, which was explicitly an attempt to um, catalyze a dialogue between more critical work on AI and education and those who are actually doing the, the development work themselves and running interventions um, in uh, educational settings. That seems to me an important uh, first step. Uh, whether we can use that as a way of uh, engaging uh, industry in some of these conversations uh, as well. Um, in order to address some of the con concerns of the like of Conrad, there are multiple others of, you know, of those kinds of proposals um, that could be drawn on. Um, but yeah, I think trying to find ways of perhaps engaging with industry to um, come to agreements about how we involve educators, students in uh, the maybe not the design particularly of, of AI, but in debates about its application um, yeah, within uh, our institution. But a huge amount to be done there, Mark, and I don't really know the answer. And hopefully we might come to a clearer sense towards the end of this series. Thank you both. Um, so next on my list is Irina uh, Dvorteskaya. I hope I pronounced that correctly. That's correctly, thank you. Uh, uh, ben, thank you very much for an extremely interesting presentation. I got the question on assessment. Uh, so how do you see what is the perspectives of assessments and especially psychometric tools uh, with, uh, uh, which are possible uh, to apply for uh, 4C uh, assessments? And how do you see, uh, can it be transformed, especially not in advanced uh, universities, but in more mediocre, uh, I would say like ordinary, normal, which are not on high, um, uh, on uh, edge. Uh, so uh, might it be that uh, their practices uh, will be uh, transformed with IE education? Thank you. Um, so, so I think the, the question was about uh, assessment and uh, psychometric tools, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm in a in a great position to to be able to answer that. I'm aware there are a number of um, research groups looking specifically into questions of assessment. Um, I mean, I think a critical question for me here is um, the issue of enabling artificial intelligence applications to assess students work um, and that might be a good idea who knows um, but I think it should only um, uh, be in place if there are opportunities for uh, if there is full transparency about how students work is being assessed by AI or as much transparency as possible um, and if there are you know means of appealing and forms of um, redress that, that are possible if uh, an automated system is, is found to have, have made some kind of uh, error. I think there, there, are, there are a series of, you know, I think important uh, and thorny uh, things to untangle there around assessment. And um, uh, I think, you know, we, we need to get the assessment experts in, in the room uh, to be addressing those kinds of things. Great, thank you. Um, next on my list, it's Sid Sidney Engelbrecht. Hi, good afternoon, all. Um, thank you for an amazing talk, very informative. My question is about AI um, detectors, um, like Turnitin. Um, are, they, uh, are you familiar with any other tools that institutions, universities, could use to detect um, the use of, for example, chat GPT in academic writing? Thank you. Um, there are several, I don't know the names of them all off the top of my head. Obviously Turnitin has tried or has launched an AI writing detector. Uh, it claims it has quite a high rate, but it recently yes realize that it has a higher error rate than it initially claimed. Um, yeah. Interestingly, OpenAI, um, obviously the who developed ChatGPT themselves launched a plagiarism detection piece of software. 
uh, and recently closed it down. They said it doesn't work, uh, and in their view, um, uh, no plagiarism, no um, AI writing detector uh, could adequately work. Um, adequately. Again, I'm, I'm aware there are people, particularly in the States, um, because in the UK we were a bit protected because Turnitin didn't really, wasn't allowed to release its AI writing detection in yeah. education institutions, but it was rolled out uh, elsewhere. Some serious reports in US media about students being wrongfully accused of cheating um, yep. by these kinds of systems. So I think we need to be very cautious about their involvement and if they are being used in institutions to um, speak to those who are responsible for for them to um or to maybe ask for them to be removed given the what looks at, at the moment like hey. very bad effects on on some students thank you so much okay thank you uh ludvika leshtia you're next yes hello thanks a lot for a really fantastic inspiring talk um, I was curious about the role of regulation or regulators uh, in education and what you know they are doing or not doing regarding uh, AI. Um, as not many you know uh, systems have completely market-based educational systems and curriculum usually is kind of co-devised with the government or the, with the ministries, especially in general education. Um, I wonder what are your views on that? Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not aware of any specific uh, regulatory instrument that could be used at the moment in relation to AI in education, whether in higher education or school-based education in but i was thinking for example quality assurance agencies right in many european systems they are really uh, checking the standards of higher education and um, you know can they do specific indicators that are you know related to AI usage i don't know i'm just thinking <laughs> yeah i think these are exactly the kinds of creative conversations that probably do need to happen the um the reason I flagged the Council of Education report is because it is a high level attempt to push for the development of particular regulatory instruments. There is There has, has been a scheme in the UK led by the Digital Futures Commission, which has pushed for the development of particular kind of regulatory instruments in relation to the collection of uh, educational data. Um, and I'm aware of other you know projects and so on, which have um, produced series of policy recommendations. Uh, I don't know the specific ways in which we we get the various different agencies and organizations and academics and other experts together in the room, um, but it probably needs to be through the involvement of international organizations of the likes of the Council of Europe. Uh, I know UNESCO has a, a, a kind of framework for, res I think it's responsible use of AI in education. Uh, and I'd be interested to see what the, the, the next steps for some something like that are. But I'm, I, I don't know at the moment. Great, thank you. So next on my list is Victor Abruco. You've posted quite a few questions, so please ask one. My favorite is about the genome, the second one, but please choose your one question. Okay. Hello, everyone. My question is, what does it mean education genome education genome like material genome is the uh, analytical and computational tools that knows everything about relationship in the field of materials i want to create the analogous tool for education system. This tool will know everything about relationship in the field of education. Is it possible? I don't know. I, I, 
I'm not sure whether you're pitching me an idea at the moment, <laughs> which I'm in no position to assess. Maybe young I'm sorry, artificial idea. intelligence knows everything. Hey, can I? Right. Okay, let's see. Moribola? Need to, okay. Can you all please mute your microphones? Right, we have sound coming, right. Okay, so um, thank you, Victor, very much. I don't think we're uh, then able to talk very much about this and we have five minutes left. So I will move on um, to Sarah Grayston. You wanted also to make a Hi. comment and question, yep. Uh, hi, Ben. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, and for me, it was really more of an observation, um, which you might want to comment upon. You mentioned Can Migo, and I'm not sure if you know, but during the summer, Instructure announced a partnership with Can Academy, um, which I believe that that means it will become, so Can Migo will become more available um, within Canvas at some point in the near future. And so my worry is, is that the kind of, imaginary around AI and education um, would result in kind of widespread usage. And um, I wonder if you have any comments about that and if it's going to make it a bit more procedural, kind of like procedural learning and also of any ethical issues. And that. I realise that's yeah. quite a big question, but just if you have any comments. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. I think that the Carmigo case is particularly fascinating because it it's rolling out in US schools. Um, so there's a, I think there are two articles by Natasha Singer in the New York Times documenting what happened. Um, so it's one of the few cases we have where a journalist, a reporter has been allowed into the classroom to observe one of these new kind of tutor bots um, in action. Um, it is super interesting that, yeah, already despite the fact that there can't be an adequate evaluation of that um, in this short period of time, you know, efforts to embed the Khan Migo tutor bot in Canvas. Um, I think that speaks to the way in which everything is proceeding in quite a kind of an accelerated uh, way at the moment without necessarily um, contending with some of the deep concerns which many people have about AI in education. Um, I mean, there, there are, uh, <laughs> I guess, other kind of ethical implications. W one might be, if we're going to demand that students ask a tutor bot questions so that they can receive personalized learning, there is an extraordinary financial cost and an environmental cost to that at the moment. Uh, how is the financial cost going to be paid? Well, the financial cost is going to be paid by ultimately institutions paying for the service and where the service provider in structure has to pay open AI that you know that the compute costs are so astronomical um, that you're talking about the potential reallocation of, of educational funding to to cover or sort of to defray the compute costs and then there's the environmental impact as well um, I mean these kinds of applications are hugely energy intensive. The data centers that are being uh, built to, to handle the, the machine learning and the compute load um, that require masses of water um, and, and have potentially really damaging environmental effects further down the chain. The extraction of natural uh, resources from the, from the planet to construct the chips and so on. Uh, so I think there's a whole bunch of issues if we really we can unpack a small example like Khan Migo as an example of you know what are all the kinds of issues that arise when we really go deep into the chain of what it means to produce these things and then what does it mean when we actually put them in, in classrooms and we've got far too little evidence of either at the moment. Great. Um, we'll have to stop here again. Thank you so much, Ben, for your really excellent talk and this discussion. Thank you, everyone, for coming in such great numbers and for the lively debates in the chat area. 
as mentioned, we have fantastic line of speakers still to come over the next five webinars. So next week, uh, we are addressing a decolonial approach to AI with uh, Michalinos and Vilas. And then we have really exciting themes as well in the coming two weeks, um, including um, the nuts and bolts of how AI works. Um, what JISC does in the UK to support universities, AI and academic labor, and we finish with chat GPT. So please do join us and continue this discussion over these three weeks. Um, and thank you so much, Ben, again. I really appreciate it. See you all on Thursday, hopefully. <laughs> thank you, Yanya. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Bye.